Hey Slags, welcome back to Slaggy Book Club and welcome to the new setting for the foreseeable future, although hopefully not for that long. Yes, I am using a tiny microphone. It is the year 2020. We are in lockdown and we are buying stupid things on the internet because people on TikTok told us to. No, there is just unfortunately some construction happening inside of this house and there are not enough breaks in the sound for me to film a video consistently and so we have resorted to the shitty tiny microphone that I bought off eBay. So like I said, I am home. The cat is well and truly out of the bag. If you watched last week's video, you would already know that. Um, and now all of my friends know it too. There were some people that I kept it a secret from so that I could surprise them. We had a couple of very cute little surprise dinner dates and coffee dates that were arranged. Um, <laughs> it's been a fun couple of weeks of seeing my friends, seeing everybody I love. And honestly, I am so, so happy to be back here at home where all of my loved ones are where my mom is all my friends my cat olive is here say hello comfort has always been a priority it has been a value that i hold so highly above so many other things and by traveling abroad indefinitely i <laughs> was completely taking myself out of comfort um, and I didn't know how long I would last and that is why the trip was indefinite um, I had a brief idea that or not even a brief idea I had a pretty strong idea that I would be there at least six months but for some reason I put six months as a sort of marker um, in my head and yeah I didn't last six months and there is a part of me that feels like I failed a bit there are aspects to my coming home that feel a little bit embarrassing if I'm being completely honest and that's why I haven't even um completely like not announced because who am I a celebrity but just like I haven't been posting on Instagram which is the platform that has like people who know me in real life things about being home um so I haven't I haven't made it clear that I am back the people who know me know the people close to me know my abstract parasocial followers now know um but yeah there's still a little part of me that feels like I I failed at what I was trying to achieve even though I don't know what I was trying to achieve other than moving abroad I just had this vision that I would go to London fall in love with London and live in London for a while and be one of those people because for some reason us 20 something Australians have this idealized dream of moving to London and I, I I don't actually know what that's rooted in in a broad sense when it applies to all of us I don't know why we aspire to that so strongly and so like commonly so many people do it or dream of it right I don't know what that's even about but for me my mum did that my mum in her 20s moved to London and lived in London for a while and travelled and that was sort of her 20s, that's what her life looked like and so I have always grown up thinking, oh that's what you do. And so I just, I guess, had an expectation that it was going to work and that I was going to enjoy it and I was going to stay. But I also know deep down that, yeah, I, I like comfort and I like Melbourne. I think it would be one thing if I was like, I just, I, I need to get out of this town. Like, I don't want to live here anymore. Like, there's more for me out there. Like, I didn't have any of those feelings. I love Melbourne and I, I, I don't see myself ending up anywhere other than Melbourne. Even if I spent years living elsewhere, I, I've always felt as if I would return. So there wasn't that aspect of sort of trying to find somewhere where I feel like I belong. Um, and I didn't really have too many clear goals or ambitions other than just being there. Um, initially before COVID, I was going to go and I'd gotten into an exchange program with my university and I was going to finish my uni course there. And then 
stay on indefinitely and that that gave me a purpose and if I had done things that way who knows what would have happened but of course the pandemic happened and I was not able to go and I dropped out of my uni course and life spirals right things happen things don't go to plan ever and I have been constantly reminding myself although not listening to <laughs> the quote wherever you go there you are I I always think of that I always remind myself of that because I do have this sort of innate desire to just run away and start a new life somewhere else sometimes I, I, I do think about that and I did have this kind of idea of of the person that I would become or, or suddenly turn into this this very social very cool fashionable whatever kind of person just because I I existed in a different location I and as much as I do live by and and think about the quote wherever you go there you are I guess I don't actually take it in or listen to it because I thought that I would change and I of course didn't I was the same person just in a different place a very unfamiliar place a very unsettling place a place where I felt uncomfortable I was talking about this with my close friend Jessie literally yesterday I lent her Trivial Grievances which I have recommended on TikTok before it's about um, being in your late 20s to early 30s and flailing and grappling with the realities of life and there is a essay in that book about I think it's titled travel won't make you a better person or something and it's that same idea of this the 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 discrepancy between how we how we idealize traveling or moving abroad and what that can mean for us and the reality of it and how it actually doesn't doesn't change anything or 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 shape us really in any significant way i know that there are people who have had that experience and will argue that it does but in in a more common sense moving to a different you know established white people city is <laughs> not going to make any change to who you are and how you feel and what your life experience is so that is all to say that i have returned home to recharge to reassess um and to figure out what i want what i want next what i want to do who i am what the fuck is going on but we are here today because i wanted to make a silly little video um it's kind of a self-indulgent idea but it's also funny to me at least i was rearranging these bookshelves uh the other day and i stumbled upon a book that is very nostalgic for me palo alto um a random book but for me not that i remember what it's about at all it was gifted to me by a boy when i was a teenager and every time i see it i think about that specific romance and I'm also reminded that that's not the only book that I was gifted by a boy when I was a teenager and so I thought it would be kind of fun to go through the books that I have been gifted from teenage boys when I was also a teenager and talk about them but first of course I do start every video with a little wrap up of what I have been reading watching and listening to lately so I have been reading non-fiction and I won't shut up about it. <laughs> I have been talking about this over on TikTok because I just feel so proud of myself for getting back into non-fiction because I used to, years ago, read pretty much 50-50 even amount of fiction, non-fiction. As I mentioned last week, I picked up Conversations on Love by Natasha Lunn and fucking adored it absolutely loved it and it slam dunked me right into a non-fiction hustle and so on my last day in london i went to foils this beautiful big multi-story bookstore in london and i went straight to their non-fiction section and i picked up two books and i've read them both now um the first one that i have talked about is girls can kiss now by Jill Gutterwitz. It is a collection of essays discussing the way that lesbianism is now portrayed in the media as not only acceptable but kind of like 
cool as opposed to in the 90s and early 2000s when it was scandalous and hypersexualized or just like not represented at all. I then read notes on heartbreak which to me was so wild just the idea that you can like that um, Annie Lord went through a breakup experienced heartbreak and thought fuck it I'm gonna capitalize on this and the writing that I feel she would have done anyway like in a journal you know the thoughts that she would have processed anyway she made into a book to capitalize on that shit like she literally just chronicled her breakup and said this is a book buy it like that to me is amazing (laughs) that to me is like something that teenage me would have fucking dreamed of doing because the way that literally my journals are only filled with me blabbing about boys and romantic feelings and you know chronicling every interaction and overthinking every conversation like this book feels like a really polished version of my journals and I love that like I feel like that's such a sleigh that is such a sleigh I really just loved the concept of notes on heartbreak um and i think if if you've recently gone through a breakup it would be a great read because it is just so relatable and literally every breakup feels the fucking same every heartbreak is the exact same for everybody that is something i've learned from reading this kind of nonfiction. since i've come home it's been almost two weeks now and i've not really been watching very much tv um i did however the other night watch a good person with Florence Pugh and Morgan Freeman, the movie that is written and directed by Zach Braff. Um, Because I was in a Florence Pugh mood, because I'll tell you why. (laughs) I saw her. I walked past her in London at Paddington Station, literally at a tube station. This little bright lady walked past me lugging a little suitcase, like looking huff and puff, like, and I'm like, I fucking feel that man. And then I realized it was literally Florence Pugh. She was wearing this all white denim outfit with like gold accessories, gold sunnies. Her hair was obviously like that shaved, but fully bleached. And she was short. She's so little. But I was just like. Did anyone? Like, but I am so glad. This was literally on my second last day there. And I'm so glad because I feel like one of the novelties of London is the proximity to celebrity. Obviously, because Australia is like so fucking far removed. Like we have nobody. Um, Teresa Vaughn. But like, I hadn't really seen anyone. I'd seen like fucking D-listers who I don't even know their names, but it's like they're in that show. They were that like background character in that show. You know, I saw someone from Skins, who I can't name. I saw someone from The Great, who I can't name. I saw someone from The Handmaid's Tale, who I can't name. Um, But I hadn't seen any A-listers. And my friend literally got complimented by Harry Styles on the street. And I was like, where's my compliment, Harry? Where's my Harry sighting? I never got one. So I will have to go back to London. Um, But in the meantime, I have seen Florence Pugh in the flesh. So... Yeah, I think that's a pretty good achievement. (laughs) But A Good Person was, to me, I liked it. I thought it was a good movie. I think I was just wowed by the performances. And for me, when I watch things, I'm watching the acting. Like, that's all I really, like, enjoy seeing is the acting, not really so much the narrative. Kind of like how I like character-driven books rather than narrative-driven. Anyways, um... Acting was amazing. I jumped onto Letterboxd and saw a bunch of bad reviews and I was like, oh... I have bad taste in movies, but we knew this. We knew this. So (laughs) also just on the topic of things I've watched and Harry Styles, I went to see The Effect, the play that Taylor Russell is in, in London. Um, It was so fucking good. It was so moving. Um, Standing ovation, the whole theater, no regrets. So glad I went to go see that. Um, If you're in London, go see it. It's very good. And my listening to, take a guess. Take a, what do you think I'm listening to right now? What album am I listening to? Yeah, obviously Guts. Um, <laughs> who's not listening to Guts? 
let's be real don't know if it slaps quite as hard as sour like sour blew my fucking mind and this is like yeah this is a bop um but the more i like learn the songs and get used to it the more i'll love it so that's on repeat right now of course so now for the actual premise of this video books i have been gifted by teenage boys <laughs> Jumping right in, the first book that I want to talk about is Not Just Lucky by Jamila Rizvi. I must have been 19 years old. My lovely, lovely, sweet, sweet boyfriend at the time gifted me this, I suppose, for my birthday, my 20th birthday. This is a feminist nonfiction book by Australian author Jamila Rizvi, which explores the idea that women tend to dismiss their achievements on luck and just, I just... I just got lucky rather than owning how hard they worked for them. I fucking adored the fact that my boyfriend saw me not just as a book lover, but as a feminist. He knew me so well. The bar was so low. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think I was the right audience, the right demographic for this book. Um, it just, I feel like it's probably is for slightly older demographic um because the ideas to me just felt a little bit obvious and almost at times patronizing when i was 15 tinder launched and a few months later i matched with my first boyfriend a boy that i literally went to school with <laughs> he was a popular footy boy two years above me and i was just this little book nerd <laughs> But, you know, the novelty of a dating app brought us together and we soon discovered that we shared an interest in John Green. As it turned out, his mother owned the local bookstore and so he put aside a copy of the newly released Fault in Our Stars at that bookstore for me to go and pick up and meet his mother. He wanted our relationship to be straight out of a John Green novel and... My romantic 15-year-old ass ate that right up. Fun fact, when we went Facebook official, his updated relationship status received multiple comments from his friends saying, is this a joke? Second fun fact, this is not the only boy who tried to have a John Green-inspired romance with me. The chokehold that that author had on my generation. In my final year of high school, my school had a change of leadership and our new principal was a man who was disliked by many, but none more so than my English class. We had this wonderful, passionate, amazing teacher who not only made us absolutely fucking love the subject, like it was our favorite class collectively, but we excelled at it like we did so well because of her passion and her teaching style but the problem is that her teaching style was unconventional and when our new principal came in he had a little bit of a problem with that teaching style and long story short that teacher left and was replaced by this fucking fruit loop man who had no experience in the subject zero and this, was, this wasn't just like English, this was English language, this was a linguistics class. So you, kinda, you, kinda, you can't just get away with like having read some books and, and knowing some basic grammar and teaching an English class. This was linguistics. We were teaching, anyway, I'm still not over it. But looping back to my first sentence, in my final year of high school, yeah, we did not do well in our exams. When I was about 18 or 19, I was hooking up with this kind of intense guy who coincidentally, but hilariously, happened to be that principal's son. But I didn't want a relationship and he didn't understand why and he got really annoying, so I ended it. Except he wouldn't take no for an answer. So in an attempt to win me over, I guess, he delivered a giant box containing about 10 books to my house. Could I name a single title from that box? Yes, the first Harry Potter, but the others? No idea, because they were straight out of the fucking QBD bargain bin. I had no interest in reading any of them, and I got rid of them very shortly after. I did read Harry Potter a few years later. Um, honestly, like, it would have been so much cuter if he just gave me that one book, because, like, my not having read Harry Potter was something that we'd spoken about, so it was relevant, but... 
the box of 10 fucking books that were not personal to me at all that meant fucking nothing was just a weird and over the top move so now while this next one is not really romantic it is incredibly fucking wholesome i'm 16 i am deep in the trenches of tumblr every night i reply to the cruel nasty messages in my ass box and post ultra personal text posts like this public website is my private diary then the news drops alexa chung has released a book i've never needed something more urgently i go out and i purchase the hardcover immediately a few months later my closest male friend gifts me the paperback. He knows me so well, I am moved to tears. This is 16. And finally, the book that holds so much weight. A book with a plot that I cannot recall by an author whose name must be thrown away with the likes of Brant Hill and Masterson. I must have been about 17 when I went on a movie date to an indie cinema to see Lost in Translation with this sweet, sweet boy who I just didn't really think I was that into. Um, I can't really remember. I must have been like flailing with my feelings, kind of trying to let him down easy maybe. Um, but he showed up at my front door with a gift. And inside is a little note that I wish I could read out because it is so cute. But of course I won't do that. There's also something written in the front page. Again, we won't read it out, but it's sad because obviously at the time when I was a teenager, I was like, ugh, ick. But now looking back, reading the notes, I'm like, it's literally so fucking romantic. I was a cow, but anyway, I still wasn't into it, so I thought for a few days, and eventually, with the help of my mom, who is a savage and should never have been involved, I came up with this message that basically said something along the lines of, hey, thank you so much, like, that's so sweet of you, um, but I hope that you weren't, like, trying to get me back by giving me that book. It's ingrained. Like, I, I will never forget this because I feel so bad. Anyways, didn't get a reply. And I was like, oh, yikes. Oh, well. And then I thought about it some more and I realized, shit. It's his birthday. I sent that text on his birthday. Which I should have known. But I was... I was a bit self-involved as a teenager. I'm not a person who really thinks about regrets or has regrets, but if I was that kind of person, this series of events would definitely be up there. Um, but now every time I see this book on my shelf, which I usually keep hidden in the back so that I don't have to think about it, um, I am reminded of what an asshole I am capable of being, but also I'm reminded of how kind some people are. So. As far as I can remember, those are the books that I was gifted as a teenager from teenage boys who kind of liked me. Pretty funny, um, kind of slay, but mostly depressing to look back on because it's honestly been years since I was gifted a book from any love interest at all. I, I'm just... I'm so single. Anyways, thanks for watching. I will be more serious next week. Maybe. <laughs> Bye! I wanna get it back. But yeah, great album.